Thank you. Can you guys all hear me? Are we good? Address the jury. This is, this is a cool setup. All right. <laughs> So uh, we'll get started. I'm Kate Aronowitz. I'm the VP of Design at Wellfront. And I'm here to talk about building an effective design team. So we only have about 25 minutes. And I want to make sure we have time for questions. So we'll get started in a minute. We think about building an effective design team. So as she mentioned, I uh, was at LinkedIn, where I was the first director of design. And in about a year, I built that team from about four designers to a dozen. At Facebook, I led design, where my main focus for five years, I built that team from 20 to over 200 before I left. Um, and now I manage a small but very mighty team of five designers just about two blocks that way. So when you think about building an effective design team, there are actually a lot of things we can cover. Today, I'm not going to go so much into what happens when you already have people on staff. This is more about thinking about your design culture, um, thinking about the types of people you want to hire, how to effectively interview, and then hopefully close them. Um, but should also be helpful to anybody that already has a team on staff. So let's get started. So took some facts here. John Maida is a design partner over at Kleiner Perkins and gave a really great talk at South by Southwest last year about the role of design in business. And these are some things that he pointed out. So to, since 2010, 27 companies uh, started by designers have been acquired by big companies out here like Google, Facebook, LinkedIn. At Facebook, I led five different acquisitions that are probably in this list. Uh, one of them in one year was actually the largest talent acquisition that we did just to get designers. Um, more and more VC-backed startups are co-founded by designers. We know that Airbnb has a designer founder. We know Pinterest does. You know, Stuart Butterfield was actually a designer once upon a time and is now enjoying success with Slack. Um, and in 2014, for the first time ever, six VC firms asked designers to come onto their leadership teams. So what does all of this mean? It means that designers are not just the people you put at the end of your process to make things look good anymore. We're much more business-minded. It also means that people are so excited to get their hands on great teams that they're willing to pay a premium in actually acquiring companies just to get great teams and designers. And if the VC firms are asking designers to join their teams, you know that it's a sign that like, design is here to stay as a key ingredient in innovation. So design is important. You guys are all in the room today. I'm assuming that you all think design is important. So if I'm a designer, I'm talking to you about your startup, and you want me to come work for you, and I say, OK, tell me, is design key to your startup? Is it key to your success? And do you have an awesome design culture? Uh, how many would you guys like, how many would raise your hand? Okay, we'll come back to it. Maybe we'll see some more hands go up. We're going to help you. But we all agree design is important at least, right? So hopefully by the end everybody can have their hand up about a great culture. So culture, design culture. It's, you know, a buzzy term in the, the companies I've worked at, uh, the companies I've consulted with. It comes up very quickly. Kate, we've got a great design culture. Kate, can you come help? Just bring the Facebook design culture and, and bring it in here. Um, if you have a design culture, awesome. Let's help you get a narrative around it. If you don't, you can build one pretty easily. Um, so what does design culture actually mean? So it's the role of design and what it plays at the company, right? It's its function. It's how it influences. And every culture at a design company should be a little bit different. It should be tailored to your mission. It should be tailored to your size and to your goals. So a couple examples of design cultures I've been around. So at Facebook, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, when you walk past his office, it's glass, and you can see what he's doing all day. He set aside at least two hours every day to meet with the designers and product managers. Like I would say that Mark is a very design-minded CEO. We spent a lot of time looking at design. At Wellfront, I'm a VP. I sit on the executive staff. I help make lots of big company decisions, not just about design with the CEO, with the CFO. I'm in there helping determine the culture, looking at the business model. I would say that Wealthfront values not only what I can bring in terms of design, but how I can think about the rest of the business. So based on my experience, I've put together five key questions you can ask yourself and kind of to build your design culture narrative. And there are no right or wrong answers to these. Some of them are more strategic, some are more tactical. So the first one, 
Is design key to you winning, and is it a differentiator? So when I think about, again, about Wealthfront, we are putting design at the center of personal finance. So I would ask you all to like open your bank account's website, and do you think that they're putting design at the center of that? The answer is kind of no right now. And Wealthfront really believes that an excellent client experience can be a way that we can set ourselves apart and win in our category. So I'd ask you, how can design actually help you win? And are you actually, actually leveraging it? Can it differentiate you from the pack that, that is surrounding you? The second, how is design involved in all areas of your company? This isn't just designing your interface. Are they involved in your advertising? Did you allow them to you know, think about your identity? How about your office space? Um, there are lots of ways to leverage design, and I think a lot of companies actually vastly underutilize the talent, which could not only make your designers happier because they like to flex their muscles across lots of things, but it also could make your company a lot stronger. So when was the last time you went to a designer for an idea or asked a designer to express an idea? So lots of companies around here, we kind of all talk about a bottoms-up culture. I hear the phrase, an idea can come from anywhere in the company. But when was the last time you actually went to a designer for an idea? Do they have a vehicle in which they can get their ideas live to site and influence your product? So maybe that's not useful at this time. But designers are great at expressing ideas. So we all sit around at whiteboards and make bulleted lists of all the features that we want to get out. How about turning that into a prototype? Much better to get feedback from your customers and internally. It's a great way to get buy-in. In fact, uh, over at Wellfront right now, we have some ideas that are like two years out, and we're building this really great prototype in order to get the company behind it. The fourth question. How much time does your leadership team or just decision makers actually spend with designers? So I'm assuming you're reviewing designs where the designer is actually presenting it to you. Or are you seeing it second, third hand? Are you getting it through email? I met with the CEO about a year and a half ago, um, a pretty popular company. It was time design so important to me. And I was asking him about the design team. It was very clear that he had not spent any time with them. <laughs> And so I suggested that one way of building his culture was to spend more time with them and get to know them and, and utilize their skills better. And the last one is very easy to answer, but we get stuck on it a lot. So where does design report to in your company? Your startups might be a lot smaller right now, but I can guarantee you know, any design leadership dinner, everybody's like, who do you report into? Are you in product? Or are you in marketing? Do you report directly to the CEO? Reporting structure is not the sole determination for success in a company, but it does send a signal. So does design report into somebody that can actually make a decision, right? Now, if you have a VP of engineering, you've got a VP of product, but you have a director of design and don't have a VP of design, I would ask you why. Um, I firmly believe that those three disciplines should be pretty close to one another in order to get the most out of it. So those are the five questions to kind of think about when building your narrative around a design culture. So the next thing you need to do is you need to kind of think about who am I going to hire? So designers come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, so I've got a team of five right now, and I made a list of all the skills that we utilized in just the past week. So there's a lot of things that you would expect up there. We've got visual design, interaction design, but I also have a full-time illustrator sitting next to me right now thinking about our brand. We're doing some awesome prototyping. I've got one guy who did some code this morning to help get something out. Um, we're thinking about some pretty heavy information architecture questions on um, user data. So, um, and we also did some user research like last Friday where we were, had people come in. So design isn't just the obvious stuff. There's a lot of other things that designers can bring to your team. However, Perfect people are hard to find. Good luck finding anyone that has all of those skill sets. So my first six months at Facebook, I was asked to hire 12 designers. And I hired exactly one. So I interviewed a lot of people. But our bar said that in order to get hired as a Facebook designer, you had to be fantastic in interaction design, do all of it, pixel perfect at visual design, you also had a great product sense, get in a room and figure out new products, 
And you also had to code and push live to site all of your own projects. That was just a bar that was way too high for anybody to possibly reach. So we very quickly had another conversation about changing what we were looking for. It wasn't about lowering the bar, it was changing what we were looking for. So unicorns, they do exist. Um, and if you have one, hold on to them. I work with a couple and have worked with a couple. So you can wait for a unicorn, but I also would tell you to beware of what I call the meh candidate. So um, we've all been in candidate debriefs where you're like, well, you know, they're, you know, they're good, they're not bad. They could probably come in and do a couple things. I could put them to work on Monday, um, but nobody feels strongly as an advocate and nobody says, get them out of here. The problem with those candidates is they will stay usually in that category while they were there. You've got precious hiring time, precious budgets, precious resources. You want to get people in there that are really good and going to make a difference. So what I tell people to do is to put people through what I call the superpower test. So um, IDEO years ago wrote about kind of the T-shaped person. Are you guys familiar with that? So the idea is that you go really deep in one discipline and then you kind of branch out in others. Instead of being a T, I'd rather have a superpower. So the idea is that anybody you bring in, you should look at them and they should be spectacular at least at one thing that you know you can leverage all the time at your company. So for instance, on my team of five, I've got two new grads that are spectacular at visual design, like really, really amazing. They can do the interaction stuff, but really good at the visual design. Um, I've got one guy that's fantastic technically. He can prototype up things very quickly. I have another uh, woman on the team who uh, can take these really complicated, gnarly, like bank linking flows and very quickly come up with a fantastic, kind of very succinct flow and, and get them out. Every single person on my team has a superpower. I know what it is and I know how to leverage it. I guarantee when you come in to work in the morning, let, put this against any hire, you want to know what their superpower is and be very excited about it. So, you're thinking about skills, you've got your design culture narrative going, it's time to interview a designer. So it's a little bit different than interviewing other people. It's all about the work. Now in 15 years of interviewing hundreds of designers, I have yet to be convinced that there's any other way than to start the day with a presentation. Every designer you hire, I really believe this, they have them come in and present to your team. Now, I give them three loose parameters before they get there. I say, you're gonna have an hour, here's the tech requirements, so you, know, you bring your laptop, we'll plug you in, and here's, gonna, here's who's gonna be in the room. And then let them go. You want to see what they present, you wanna see the work, right? Did they present only their most recent work, or only uh, their fun work from school and nothing from their recent job? How do they talk about their roles? How do they talk about their goals? Did they give credit to anybody else in their presentation? Did they manage time? Did they leave time for questions at the end? Design isn't just about the work, it's about how your designer's gonna present themselves and present the work at the company and everything that goes into that. And a design presentation, really, really important for that. The last thing, uh, quickly on interviewing here, is the design exercise. So do you give a design exercise or not? What I mean by about design exercise, and if you're familiar, you basically say, hey, here's our home page. Here's our sign up flow. Take it home. You've got 24 hours to redesign it and give it back to me, right? So I have mixed feelings about design exercises. I've had years where I've given them and years where I haven't. The first thing to think about is if you're looking for great design ideas or pixel perfect design in a design exercise, you're not going to get it. This person can't possibly do better than what your in house team can. If they can, that's awesome. But really, what you're looking at is how do they think, right? What questions do they ask? What's the process that they go through? So that's kind of the design exercise. And then I would probably group your candidates into two buckets. You've got your new grads and you've got your experienced people. We have a new grad on my team and she told me, she said, Kate, I love the direct design exercise from last year. She was graduating from college. She was like, it was the first real work I was ever asked to do. They were, she was very excited about doing real-world problems and, and bringing them back. So if there's a design exercise for new grads, I think that's great. For more experienced candidates, I would just ask you why you're giving an experienced candidate with a robust portfolio a design exercise. If you're not seeing something in that portfolio that speaks to you, 
I would just ask yourself why. Um, and experienced candidates are probably interviewing at other places. I don't think they want a stack of exercises to do. Um, the other thing is you can always do an on-site exercise, which I'm a fan of, again, to learn how people think. So at Wealthfront, we basically set aside 45 minutes to an hour. We start the hour with a designer and an engineer in the room. We kind of present the problem. It's usually a flow to see how they think. Give them 10, 15 minutes by themselves, and then we get back, and it's a collaborative exercise. Again, how are they going to work with the people on your team? What questions do they ask? Again, not about getting pixel-perfect designs. So those are a few things, I think, that are really important when uh, interviewing designers. So closing, you found an awesome designer and you want them to come join your company. First thing to notice, we notice everything. So designers really do. They notice your identity. They notice your office space. When I came in to interview at Wealthfront, the first thing I said to the CEO, I'm like, your, your logo is like crooked in the lobby. This is awful. Like, I'm going to redesign your next office space. And lo and behold, we're in a new office space. And you can come visit. It looks very nice. So, um, so if you have the crooked logo, it's OK. The designer can be a part of that. But let them know you want them to be a part of it. Designers, again, they don't want to just be stuck in the corner doing your product work. They want to help make you a better company. And the last thing, we've talked a lot about designers and their work. We are our work. So being able to ship great product that we're proud of, that's the number one thing we want. It's the number one thing I talk to my designers about every week. It's not, you know, we want good benefits. We want a good mission to work towards, certainly. But all of my one-on-ones almost always end up on, Kate, how can I get better work out? How can I, uh, you know, leverage myself better? How can I, how can I get through more? Um, and I think like, that's the number one reason designers leave companies, is they're unable to ship great work that they're excited about. So the closing candidates there. So that's about all I have. But so show of hands, going back to what we thought about earlier, based on what you're thinking about from this presentation, how many of you think are doing a really good job at kind of interviewing? You've got your culture and everything established. Awesome. We've got one guy in front. <laughs> Would this, is this helpful? Would this be helpful? Okay, good.